Hello, my name is David Thurman, and I'm both the principal investigator for Lidos' Zero Trust uh, IRAD and a digital solution architect here at Lidos. I have been working with data solutions for over 15 years now, solving large complex problems from how to leverage data in a disparate environment so that organizations can have a better understanding of how to improve their overall uh, operations, but also uh, working with them to better understand how their data can best be protected. I'm joined today to uh, explore the journey of Zero Trust here with Jesse Peoples. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, David, uh, and thanks for having me join you today for this conversation around cybersecurity technologies for tomorrow. Again, I'm Jesse Peoples. My role is Chief Security Architect at Lytos, and I'm focused on Zero Trust research and development. I help to develop the Lytos Zero Trust Readiness Tool Suite, and I lead the proving ground where we identify and test security products. In a previous role, I led one of the largest federal SOCs as a chief security architect. Awesome, thanks, Jesse. So the term zero trust has become oversaturated in cyber community, but the principles really have become synonymous with what is considered the best practices for cybersecurity and what we anticipate cybersecurity postures to be in the future. So as we have this discussion, I know we want to talk about today and tomorrow. Let's start with today and let's really explore Jesse, in your experience with a lot of the organizations that you've been uh, working with, what are some of the uh, challenges as well as some of the areas of, of, um, of strength that a lot of these organizations have that you've identified thus far? Good question, David. So over the past two years, I've been deep diving into zero trust architectures and implementations. I've had the opportunity to work with customers in the civilian, health, defense, and intelligence communities. Even though these agencies have very different environments, I'm seeing some common strengths and themes. Uh, the first strength is federal agencies know what zero trust is and what it is not. There is an understanding that there's a need to advance cybersecurity and it will take a culture shift. Second, uh, customers understand that zero trust is not a single product, but current and future technologies will help them mature their security posture. And lastly, for strengths, I'm seeing that most maturities in the implementation of ICAM solutions and leveraging granular access control policies for device posture checks. With strengths, you have challenges, right? So federal agencies are having a lot of challenges as they work toward maturing their, their architecture. I've seen a common theme in around three areas that I wanna talk about. First is having enough skilled cybersecurity workforce to design, implement, and maintain the cybersecurity technologies. Second, how to accelerate technology adoption and design a flexible architecture. Lastly, again, with the explosion of data in their environments, how do agencies secure and manage the data without crippling their ability to share that data that enables their mission? Yeah, and I think you, you highlight on, on several challenges here. And I think there is, has been this shift really recently in organizations really understanding what Zero Trust is and how to apply it within their environment and what this cybersecurity posture will look like for tomorrow. But one of the big challenges is that cultural component, right? It's not necessarily tied to a technological um, insertion or a technological uh, advancement in specific area, but it's helping the organization as well as the individuals of that organization really understand how this cross pillar or uh, integrated approach to cybersecurity is going to be uh, first and foremost within their environment. So you and I have talked quite a bit about how important training is. Uh, we here at Lidos have worked significantly in building up a training pipeline, um, helping identify resources both from vendors as well as we've created our own uh, training and toolkits for uh, individuals who are wanting to get more involved in the cybersecurity space, especially as we look to these different pillars. But what are some of the things, I mean, this is just a, a portion of the problem and, and we, we're only providing training is just a part of that solution. What are some of the other uh, areas that you can see organizations really bolster this approach to help uh, address that cultural challenge? Yeah, so as you and I have discussed in the past, uh, finding and retain, retaining uh, skilled cybersecurity professionals can be a significant challenge. Implementations of cybersecurity architectures require expertise in areas of network security and identity access management, but there's also a need for interdisciplinary knowledge, right? And, and what I mean by that is security engineers will need to collaborate with teams or have knowledge of enterprise IT systems, tactical edge systems, uh, compliance, and, and even legal. What I see is the need for the talent to be more adaptable and flexible 
and learning new skills just as fast as techno new technology emerges. An example would be a network engineer that uses uh, traditional perimeter defenses must now expand their skills to use software-defined networking, SASE solutions, and implementing micro-segmentation. Another good example is a traditional SOC analyst may need to expand their skills to be able to write playbooks for automation using SOAR tools. To stay ahead of our adversaries, agencies, and industry need to heavily invest in the workforce. Um, this means that, you know, we all need to support cybersecurity upskilling for folks on a non-traditional path and a traditional cyber career path. Something exciting that I've seen recently is system integrators like Lytos collaborating with uh, our vendor partners in academia, creating those training paths to include certifications and um, training on specific tooling that uh, the customers are looking to implement. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you talk about that partnership with academia, right? Because I think it is really critical that, you know, as we start looking to bringing in individuals from university, right, those early in their career, helping instill some of this integrated approach or integrated mentality is going to be critical. But there's also that element of those that have been running, you know, socks and knocks, right? What are some of the ways that they can look outside of their paradigm that I, I've found to be really exciting? And and most of the time, they've really been excited to embrace a, a new way of looking at things uh, to, to expand kind of their aperture, if you will, so that they can look at these challenges from uh, multiple different angles than their kind of traditional views. So that being said, you did mention a little bit there, partnering with vendors, partnering with the universities. I know the uh, Zero Trust Proving Ground here at Lidos, you've worked very closely with a lot of our vendors. Um, and it's, it's really important when we work with organizations for them to understand uh, not only these cultural challenges, but also how the technology itself can help advance their architecture. And so in your relationship with these vendors, you've done a lot to help uh, expedite or accelerate that zero trust journey. And so I would like for you to talk a little bit about how you've collaborated with vendors, uh, where are some of the benefits that you've identified uh, by working with vendors and organizations to help advance their maturity? So vendor products um, help enable zero trust, but their, their vendor landscape is really crowded with evolving technologies. I see many of our agency leaders are inundated with marketing, so it's challenging for them to identify the right solutions for their architecture and it's costly for them to pilot interoperability with legacy technologies. Um, with, with the Zero Trust Proven Ground, where we identify the best of breed technologies, integrate them into a secure architecture, and validate their capabilities with testing tools, this helps reduce the adoption risk for our customers. We do this in a lab environment that is designed to simulate our customers' hybrid and multi-cloud environments. I work really closely with the vendors, um, and we do this to partner and validate the latest technology against our customers' use cases. Sometimes we, you, we get access to technology even before it's publicly available. We provide at Lytos that independent third-party evaluation to assist our customers in accelerating adoption through products of evaluations and deployable automation, such as infrastructure as code and microservices. The, the proven grounds findings are inputs into our zero trust readiness assessment and their, our technology roadmaps. Yeah, I think that's probably my favorite part of, of what you guys do is how it integrates into that assessment process, right? Um, we've, we've been building out kind of that the ZTRL assessment platform, but being able to drop in a tool and understand how that takes you from today's maturity to tomorrow's goals um, and the features that are associated with it. And it helped really, it, it really helps reduce uh, the amount of time spent on doing that market analysis because you guys have already done it, but also helps the organization understand what's the biggest bang for their buck when they're trying to address some of those gaps within their architecture. So it's really exciting stuff you guys are doing there today, but I do want to transition here for a minute to uh, my favorite topic, which is tomorrow. I'm as a principal investigator, uh, I'm always having to look down the road and see where do we want to go uh, from an R&D standpoint, but also where where is technology leading us? Where are the new capabilities and features that are out there? And, and something that I get really excited about uh, is the integration of tools like AIML or a lot of the different uh, advanced technologies that are uh, really starting to, to percolate to the top. And so as we look to that new type of world, one of the things that is going to be really important is having an architecture that allows us to enable all of those technologies. I would say 
historically, we've been really focused from an architectural standpoint and how we can scale. Um, and it's it's be gone beyond that as we start looking at embracing a lot of these analytic tools that are out there. Uh, we're going to have to shift to a more open framework rather than that kind of lockdown framework that we've had into the past. Integration is going to have to be first and foremost. And there's got to be a massive fo focus on flexibility, right? Um, it's the integration and interoperability of individual components for the core architectural technologies, right? So how do we allow these tools and how are vendors addressing that challenge of these tools being able to work across their different kind of core functions or what they're should the areas that they're traditionally focused in and and you and i've talked a lot about this as well uh with a lot of our colleagues uh we call it our security mesh environment right and uh i think as organizations look to the future it's going to become much more important that we have this mesh type approach that allows not only the organization to be able to pivot to include these uh, components but also the individual products right how are they able to leverage whether it be risk scoring, uh, like tools like what our PDP core uh, capability does, or if it's other types of analytics within the environment to identify potential threats. How is that being leveraged uh, and how can we expand the current architecture to allow those to operate? So I think that's going to be a really exciting kind of um, way to look at architecting new environments and even uh, pivoting the current existing environments. But that does lead me to kind of that next technological uh, you know, uh, framework or that next technological uh, insertion point, which is a lot of these new and upcoming or emerging technologies, which is, you know, generative AI, post-quantum computing. You can't go a day without hearing someone talk about these. They're the, the probably the hottest topics. And they are becoming very integral to the way businesses operate. Um, and especially when we start looking at their capabilities within the cyber framework. And so, from your kind of collaboration with vendors and thinking through that security mesh environment, right? How how are vendors looking to leverage these types of technologies, whether they be a part of their tools or is what I like to call side carts to the tools that allow them to bolster their effectiveness and provide that added security? I'd be I'd love to hear kind of do they and, and see them being incorporated into the roadmap or are they parts of uh, uh, functionalities that they're building out within their tools? Yeah, and you hit on some key ones there, like um, quantum computing and AI and ML. Um, let's, let's start with post-quantum cryptography, which is about proactively developing advanced security capabilities uh, to secure critical information systems from being compromised through the use of quantum computers. Like, we know that our adversaries will eventually um, have quantum computers and will attack our non-quantum resistance cryptography, uh, cryptographic algorithms, right? So. We are looking into this very heavily. Um, we are pretty early in the quantum readiness journey, but understand that there's a need for us to assess our environments for reliance of quantum um, algorithms. Also develop roadmaps and, and engage with industry around the topic. We've write, written several papers um, submitted to organizations like IEEE on this topic. Uh, the other interesting technology that's on the top of my list and probably everyone else's is artificial intelligence, but more specifically, generative AI and, and chat GPT. If I, if I take a step back, um, the use of autom automation, artificial intelligence and machine learning has been a focal point of mine uh, when working with security tools for, for years now. Starting back when I was a chief security architect for a SOC, I always looked how security tools um, incorporated automation and AI ML to assist with threat detection, incident response, and vulnerability assessments. AI and ML is very helpful in identifying things of interest that need to be further evaluated by humans. It's also important to use AI ML for evaluating insider threat. It, it helps provide that user and entity behavior analytics. Now, there's a lot of interest in how generative AI can be used in cybersecurity. One thing we know is that our adversaries um, will use generative AI. For, well, we know this from uh, several intelligence reports that our adversaries are already using generative AI to create a uh, right malicious code and to produce that credible um, sounding phishing and uh, spear phishing content that's used for social engineering attacks. Some of our vendor partners are out front developing this intelligence and in turn, 
they're leveraging generative AI and natural, la natural language models that interface with security tools to build stronger defensive tools and to make the tools more accessible to a wider range of users. Using natural language opens up the door for to add on security um, analysts to be able to use the tools. A focus area for Lytos around generative AI is to build those secure environments where our customers can train and leverage models while protecting their own sensitive data. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a interesting point, right? When we start looking at these architectures, they're going to be leveraging these different uh, technologies like automation and uh, machine learning, right? It's going to require um, a lot of thought into what are those tools leveraging uh, to train themselves, or how are they being integrated into um, how the security protocols are being enforced. And it does lead me down kind of a path where you know, if you think about things like generative AI, right, it's an incredibly powerful tool and it provides a lot of benefit to organizations, especially when they're dealing with these large amounts of, of data that are specifically unstructured dealing with language. And, you know, when you look at the, the amount of information required to train these models, it is massive. And that is one of the biggest challenges we have uh, as we go into the future is, Technology is requiring uh, or creating more and more data, but also there's a challenge of knowing what data out, what data is out there and what are the challenges. So I, I do want to talk a little bit about some some uh, some vulnerabilities, if you will, or some potential challenges uh, with generative AI or you know the application of these tools. And that's you know while on the one hand there's a lot of benefits, and as you mentioned earlier, people on their journey have you know, they've, there's a lot of things they've succeeded on, a lot of things they've had challenges with. Generative AI is helping us start to uncover some of those. So um, some of that being the amount of data required to train these tools is going to be massive. And understanding what is the data, what is actually in that data and understanding are there buried um, artifacts within that data that could be uh, potentially leaked uh, in a way that you would not want to expose the inner workings of your organization. Uh, how responses are generated? Can you uh, aggregate data across different types of uh, responses are generated from a large language model that uh, provide maybe insight into specific IP or inner workings of an organization, which could make that organization vulnerable, not to mention uh, PII and some of the traditional um, data elements that you would want to protect. So that's one challenge. But then I think there's also the computational challenge, which is how do we really uh, bring this data to bear within massive organizations where the data continues to grow? And I think this is a space that's very exciting because you you can work with large language models, but there's also leveraging a lot of other machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities. You can start to identify data that's similar within a network or data that's being um, leveraged in similar ways that maybe one might be considered sensitive while the other is not. And so identifying where are the, the critical components and, and where are the, the critical differences between those which help identify from a machine learning standpoint, which of those might uh, make it more, more uh, sensitive and something you don't want to, to exploit for large language models or even something that you want to expose uh, to an external community. So there's a lot of excitement that I have uh, when it comes to generative AI. Um, there's also a lot of challenges to be faced. Um, and I know a lot of organizations are, are working on, on addressing those and I think, uh, the next three to five years are going to be an exciting time as we see uh, this explosion of technology continue to flourish. So um, I, with that, I do want to wrap up with a simple question for you, Jesse. We talked a little bit about post-quantum. Uh, we talked about generative AI. Uh, which of those uh, are you putting your money on for the next five years to really uh, to disrupt the market the most? I'm, today, I'm definitely going to go with generative AI. I mean, I'm really excited to see what, what, we, what we find out uh, from using this, this technology. Yeah, awesome. I will, uh, we're going to look you up in a couple of years and see if you're right. So really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about these things with you. I think we covered both what things are looking like today, how people's journeys are progressing to tomorrow and some of those technologies. So uh, looking forward to continue exploring these with you. Appreciate your time and uh, we'll chat again soon. Take care. Thank you, David. Bye.